amazing event. My name is Kelly Brownell, and I'm the Dean of the Sanford School of Public Policy. This is the Terry Sanford Distinguished Lecture, entitled Civil Rights and the People's Party, featuring Democratic National Committee Chairman Tom Perez. The Terry Sanford Distinguished Lecture is sponsored by the Sanford School of Public Policy with support from the William R. Keenan Charitable Trust. The lecture series honors Terry Sanford, the founder of the Sanford School, who dedicated his life to ethical leadership and public life. Sanford was a North Carolina governor in the early 1960s, president of Duke for 15 years, and a U.S. Senator. Late August, last August rather, he would have been 100 years old. We have been celebrating this legacy in a series of centennial events throughout this academic year. As governor of North Carolina, Terry Sanford focused on strengthening education, combating poverty, and expanding civil rights. He was later recognized as one of the 10 best governors of the 20th century. At Duke, he was widely credited with quickly advancing the institution from being a respected Southern college into a world-class research institution. During that time, Sanford founded Duke's Public Policy Institute with the goal of educating future public leaders. It was among the first such programs in the nation for training undergraduates. The Institute now stands as the Sanford School of Public Policy, which supports the appointment of more than 80 faculty members. The school offers one of Duke's largest undergraduate majors, several master's degree programs, and a PhD program, and encompasses multiple research centers. In keeping with the spirit of Terry Sanford, the purpose of this distinguished lecture is to bring to campus, and I quote, men and women of the highest personal and professional stature to speak with the Duke community. For tonight's event, Tom Perez will be in conversation with Assistant Professor of Public Policy and Political Scientist Deandra Rose. Professor Rose has just published a book titled Citizens by Degree, Higher Education Policy and the Changing Gender Dynamics of American Citizenship. It examines the development of landmark U.S. higher education policies and their impact on the progress women have made since the mid-19th, since the mid-20th century. Mr. Perez became the chair of the Democratic National Committee in February of 2017. He leads the DNC's efforts to raise money, hire staff, and coordinate strategy to support candidates throughout the country for local, state, and national offices. Since taking the helm, Mr. Perez has instituted a comprehensive organizing plan hiring local organizers in all 50 states. Previously, from 2013 through 2017, he served in the Obama administration as U.S. Secretary of Labor. There, he fought to secure collective bargaining rights, better wages and overtime pay, and more secure pensions. Before that, he was Assistant Attorney General for Civil Rights in the U.S. Justice Department. Before we give Mr. Perez and Professor Rose a warm welcome, and to welcome Mr. Perez to the Sanford School of Public Policy, just a couple of notes about tonight's event. After the dialogue, there will be time for questions and answers. There are microphones on the ground floor here and in the lobby one flight up. So please find a microphone. There will also be a roaming mic. We are recording this talk and in fact are live now on Facebook and on the Sanford School's YouTube page. After the talk, I welcome you to join me, Professor Rose, and Chairman Perez for a reception in the lobby, one floor up. Thank you for coming tonight. Please join me in welcoming Professor DeAndre Rose and Chairman Tom Perez. So thank you so much, Kelly, and welcome to everyone. Thank you so much for being here tonight. Chairman Perez, we're so excited to have you with us. Thank you so much for being here. It's an honor to be here. Call me Tom, it's a lot quicker. All right, Tom, thank you. <laughs> so your personal background is fascinating. You're the son of immigrants. You grew up in Buffalo, a very chilly place. Um, and you mentioned how you lost your father at a fairly early age. I wonder if you could talk a little bit about how that helped to lead you to public service. Sure. Uh, and before I get into that, I simply want to say thank you. It's such an honor to be back here. I've spent uh, some time at your business school working with some tremendous leaders. I spent some time working with a wonderful woman named Brenda Armstrong 
in your medical school. Uh, you have a tremendous cadre of uh, leaders here whose uh, uh, common ground is uh, they're trying to build tomorrow's leaders in service of a greater good. So it's, it's uh, truly an honor to be here, especially with uh, the name Terry Sanford. Uh, that's the good housekeeping seal of approval. Uh, you know, I'm Buffalo Minican. Uh, I was born in Buffalo, New York. Uh, my parents came to the United States from the Dominican Republic. Uh, they settled in Buffalo because of the similarities in the weather between DR <laughs> and Buffalo. And uh, uh, they got off the wrong bus, if that was their goal. Uh, actually, they, they left the Dominican Republic because there was a terrible dictator. And, and frankly, they got kicked out, declared non grata. And that's what brought us to the United States. And, they love this country because this country gave them freedom and opportunity. And my, my mother was one of nine. Her siblings, uh, all of her male siblings except one, served with distinction as part of America's greatest generation. My father was drafted as a legal immigrant, served with distinction. Uh, my, I had siblings born all around the country because of uh, he moved around in the service and he got a job at the VA hospital in Buffalo, New York. And that's how I got there and how I was born there. And uh, 1974 was a challenging year because my mother had been very sick. And uh, if you had told us, I'm, I'm the youngest of five, if you told us that one of our parents was going to die that year, it would have been my mom that we all would have guessed because she had some serious issues. And she had some major surgery. She was getting better. And then my dad um, had a heart attack on Easter Sunday of 74. And then he had a second fatal one a few months later. And then um, after... Uh, we returned from the Dominican Republic, um, and my mom got sick, and she was hospitalized. And I bring that up simply because I remember going to bed that summer night because when my dad was first um, in the hospital with his first heart attack, they were trying to um, lighten the load for me. So they said, you don't need to worry about it. It's, it's not serious. Hmm. And, and then, you know, that was wrong. And so when my mom went back into the hospital and they told me that wasn't serious, I was like, fooled you once, shame on you. Fooled you twice, shame on me. And, uh, and for me, the lesson that I learned from that was uh, you never take any day on this planet um, for granted. Mm -hmm. uh, if you talk to any of my colleagues in any of the jobs I've had and ask them, uh, when does Tom get angry? The answer they would give you is when he perceives that we are wasting time. Uh, time is not uh, a commodity that is in unlimited supply. Uh, I was in Memphis last week, and you know, Dr. King once said, you know, time is neutral. It can be used for good purposes or for bad purposes. I choose to use it for good purposes. And, and if there's one lesson I took away from my um, experiences growing up is that you have to live life with a sense of purpose because, frankly, so many of the people that we try to help, whether it's dreamers, whether it's the person who lost her job, whether it's the person suffering from opioid addiction, whether it's the person looking for that pension that they thought they had that isn't there, um, uh, they've run out of time. Mm -hmm. and, and so I try to live my life with that sense of urgency each mm -hmm. day. Mm -hmm. So after, um, after undergrad, you, you put yourself, you worked as a, a sanitation worker I did. Uh, when you were going to Memphis last week with uh -huh. the sanitation workers was um, an honor. Yeah. It was, it's hard work. Uh, not much harder for the sanitation workers in Memphis mm -hmm. because of all they had to confront. Mm -hmm. And so you did that while an undergraduate at Brown and then went to law school at Harvard. And after law school, you decided to pursue civil rights law. What made you choose that path? Well, I mean, my parents taught me that if you want to get to heaven, you got to have letters of reference from folks living in the shadows. Um, but they never told me how many. Uh, and uh, I just, I wanted to change the world for the better. Mm -hmm. And I looked around, and uh, all my siblings actually are doctors. Mm -hmm. And after I passed out watching my brother operate, I realized I needed a different line of work. <laughs> and uh, and I, I chose to pursue public service you know, through public interest law because I looked at change agents around the country, and uh, they seemed to be disproportionately lawyers. Hmm. Uh, and I had an opportunity. My, my work-study job in college, I, I worked at a place called the Rhode Island Commission for Human Rights. And it was the beginning of the Reagan administration. And there had been a lot of cuts in funding for legal services-type programs. And so they were laying off a lot of people. 
And through that, I got an opportunity to be a, an investigator at this agency which, whose mission was to investigate claims of discrimination. And um, seeing the suffering firsthand uh, was really transformational for me. And, and I would say to any students who are here, uh, one of the most important things I had in school was I had the opportunity to develop some mentors. Mm -hmm. And uh, you have some tremendous uh, professors here. And I hope you will uh, uh, you know, take it upon yourself to develop those relationships. Because I was a Catholic boy from Buffalo. Uh, diversity was Northern Europe and Southern Europe and us. <laughs> and uh, my mentor in uh, college was uh, an Orthodox Jew from New York City. And uh, that's what college was all about, broadening my horizons, making me understand. And, and, and what he did more than anything was to persuade me to believe in myself. Because sometimes you get into these situations where you're wondering, like, why am I here? I can't do this. Mm -hmm. And he always said to me, nobody can make you feel inferior uh, without your consent. Mm -hmm. And when you have mentors, they can really uh, help you out. Mm -hmm. So you have a distinguished record of service as the U.S. Secretary of Labor, but before you did that, you worked as a member of the county council in Montgomery County, Maryland. And so I wonder um, if you could talk a little bit about how that role has shaped your perspective on government, so working particularly in state and local at those levels. Well, I've had the privilege of serving in local government mm -hmm. in elected capacity. I've had the privilege of serving as a state cabinet secretary. I've had the privilege of working at the uh, federal level, both uh, in the executive branch, in the uh, legislative branch for Senator Kennedy, and, and my first job out of uh, graduate school was as a law clerk for a judge. So I've had, I, I can't hold a job is another way to describe it, uh, which is odd for the former labor secretary, but I digress. Um, and, um, and for me, I've always uh, tried to look at where I was in every chapter in life. In 2001, uh, I, I worked in the uh, Clinton administration until January 20th, 2001 mm -hmm. at 11.59. And, uh, and I was looking to figure out what's the best way to make a difference. Uh, I had very young children at that point. Uh, my wife said to me one day, you know, you go around the country helping to make communities better that had been torn apart by some pretty bad issues. Why don't you uh, spend some time in your own community? And I had been doing that through some public service, but it, it kind of made me think. And, um, and, and what I would say to folks, especially people trying to figure out what to do next, there's this myth that the only place to make a difference is at a federal level. And I'm here to dispel that myth. Um, I loved every job I've ever had in my life, uh, whether it was uh, a federal prosecutor doing hate crimes cases, whether it was... Uh, the cabinet secretary for Martin O'Malley in, in uh, Maryland, or whether it was working on the Montgomery County Council. Uh, we, we were a nine-member body. Uh, we had a $4 billion with a B budget, uh, bigger than about a half a dozen states. And the ability to make a difference at a local government level was great. Uh, every time I drive past my kids' elementary school and I see the school-based health clinic mm -hmm. that I was able to take the lead on, I mean, there's a robust evidence base uh, that when you have access to health care within a trusted institution in a community like a school, it raises outcomes not only for students but for their families. And, uh, and we did some remarkable things at a local government level uh, to, to make a difference in the lives of people. Mm -hmm. And so I hope as you figure out what you want to do, and by the way, when you work in local government, there's a lot less layers. And, and uh, when you work in state and local government, they can't print money. So they got to solve problems. When I was on the Montgomery County Council, um, one of my closest allies was our Republican on the council. We, we just clicked, and we trusted each other, and we got stuff done. And very few of the things we did had a partisan edge to it. It was just building good schools and, and building community. Mm -hmm. And so it was a very fulfilling part of my uh, um, very circuitous journey. Mm -hmm. And so now, this circuitous journey has led you to leading the National Party as chair. And so thinking a little bit about the challenging role that you stepped into, um, so I'll take us back to when you assumed the role at the beginning of 2017. So since 2008, the Democrats have lost control over both houses of Congress, 12 governorships, and more than 1,000 seats in state legislatures. 
So, and of course, there was the devastating loss of the White House in 2016. So how do you and your team at the DNC plan to win them back? Don't forget the loss of state attorneys generals mm -hmm. and secretaries of state as well. Mm -hmm. Didn't want to leave them out. And state treasurers. Uh, uh, that's why I ran. I mean, I, I, uh, people ask, uh, what, do you, what do you make of the presidency, you know, the, the 2016 election? And if the question presented as we, con as we continue this rebuild of the Democratic Party and the Democratic Party's brand, if the question presented is simply what happened in 2016, I would respectfully assert that that is a too, that's an unduly narrow question to ask. Um, I ran for this job because I understand that elections have consequences. Uh, people ask me what I miss the most about my last job, and that's an easy question to answer. Uh, I miss helping people at scale. You know, when you go home at the end of the week and you say to your uh, kids, uh, I helped two million home health workers, mostly women of color, on food stamps get access to minimum wage and overtime protections through the inaction, enactment of uh, um, a new rule. Uh, that, for me, is the definition of a good week. And, the, uh, and so the question presented is, uh, what happened? And it wasn't just what happened November of 2016. What happened that resulted in all these catastrophic losses? And, and that was the first order of business, because I walked into a place that was a turnaround job at scale. I walked into a place where we needed to change the culture. And before you can do that, you've got to diagnose what happened over a long period of time. And, and here's what we learned. Uh, we stopped organizing everywhere. You know, we were the party of grassroots organizing. And we stopped doing that. Uh, we organized in a few states, so-called uh, swing states. But we stopped organizing everywhere. We were the party that had a technology advantage, second to none. We built the first and most robust voter file. And in the world of technology, uh, you have to continue to innovate every single day. And a lot of the challenges stem from an observation I would make that our mission de facto uh, devolved from uh, being the party whose mission is to elect people up and down the ballot from the school board to the Oval Office to the party whose mission was to elect uh, the president every four years. Mm -hmm. And, and when, when the only mission really is to elect the president every four years, um, you end up with a 10-month innovation cycle every fourth year. How do you run a business if you have a 10-month innovation cycle every fourth year? And how do you run a party when you're in the same situation? And so the first thing we had to do, Professor, is change our mission statement, and we did. Uh, our, the mission of today's DNC, the new DNC, is to elect Democrats up and down the ballot from the school board to the Oval Office. There was a Supreme Court race last week in Wisconsin. We invested in that race, and we won that race. There were special elections in Oklahoma last year, and we invested in those races, and we helped to win those races. Uh, there was Doug Jones in Alabama, and we were one of the earliest investors in Doug Jones because... We firmly believe that we, our mission is to elect people up and down the ballot from the school board to the Oval Office. And you do that by building a strong party infrastructure and by building strong partnerships with our friends in uh, the ecosystem, whether it's our friends in organized labor, whether it's the emerging organizations who inspire me, whether it's um, Planned Parenthood. And, um, and, and we've been able to be successful because we have done that, and we have uh, taken the term off year out of the lexicon of the Democratic Party. Mm -hmm. uh, and we have our, our partnership with the 50 state parties is, uh, we, we call it every zip code counts. We're investing everywhere, and, and we're, we're leading with our values as well. This, this is both an infrastructure job and a messaging job. We have to build the organizing infrastructure. We have to build the voter protection infrastructure. North Carolina knows a lot about voter suppression, regrettably. We have to build the technology infrastructure, and we've been able to recruit tremendous talent to do that. Our, our CTO was the 25th employee at Twitter. Uh, he built their infrastructure. He then went to Uber and designed their self-driving vehicle program. Our, our chief cyber officer was the chief cyber officer at Yahoo, and he came there right in the midst of the hack 
uh, which was a Russian hack. And so we have a person on our team who is, uh, you know, uh, he was DEF CON 1 in a prior life. And so when you have the right people, mm -hmm. when, you, when you have the humility to look and see what you did wrong, mm -hmm. and, uh, and when you get out there, and, and our partnership, it's every zip code counts. Howard Dean had a 50-state strategy. He was right. And, and we, we have a 57-state strategy because we don't want to leave the District of Columbia and Puerto Rico and the territories out. And uh, that has been a key, I think, to our success. We've won over 40 seats hmm. um, since the beginning of 2017, and we're winning everywhere. There's a lesson, one of the many lessons I've learned is that we can win everywhere. Hmm. We are winning everywhere. Hmm. And we win everywhere when we field good candidates, when we lead with our values, when we organize, and when we build those partnerships. So we're, we're building authentic relationships with voters, not transactional relationships. That's what all too frequently happened. I met a woman in an African-American church in Detroit when I was on my early listening tour, and she said to me, you got to stop showing up every 4th October telling me that you care. She's spot on. That was one of many reasons why we invested in Alabama. Uh, and 100% just about of our million dollars that we invested went into African-American organizing because we had taken you know, one of our most loyal constituencies for granted. That's a shame on us moment, and never again. Mm -hmm. So in addition to all the strategy, how much of the outlook for Democrats in the upcoming elections, and I'd say even with victories like um, the Alabama win for Doug Jones, how much of that is Donald Trump, the Trump effect? I mean, one might argue that Donald Trump is the Democratic Party's MVP for the upcoming races. <laughs> Well, I mean, Donald Trump has undeniably awakened our democracy. That is a silver lining of uh, his ascension to power. The number of people who said, well, he can't possibly be that bad. Well, actually, he's worse, in my judgment. This is the most serious uh, stress test on our democracy and our nation's history. And this is a global virus that we're confronting. Uh, I invite you to take a look at an op-ed piece from Madeleine Albright. Uh, in the New York Times, it was today or yesterday, uh, and I've spent a fair amount of time with her in recent months. I mean, you look at what's happening in Hungary, you look at what's happening in Czech Republic, which is her birth home, you, you, you look at what's happening uh, in the Philippines or in Malaysia or in Turkey or elsewhere, and, and you see this Austria. I mean, this, this, this virus of nativism is undeniable. But you know what? Um, I am of the firm belief that uh, we're not simply the party that opposes Donald Trump. We're the party that stands up for what our values are. And I'm, I'm proud to be a Democrat. And when we're out there talking to people, we're talking about the fact that the Democratic Party has your back on the issues that matter most. We have your back on health care. We have your back on education. That's what Oklahoma and West Virginia and other states are about. When I was out there in Oklahoma last summer, I knew you got kids going to school four days a week. I've done many symposiums and workshops on the future of work. I never had a person come in and say, I've got an idea for how to prepare the 21st century workforce. Let's have youngsters go to school four days a week. That is not a best practice, but that is happening. Kids and, might disagree. Well, actually, <laughs> the mom, that mom who's uh, going paycheck to paycheck, who now has to figure out, what do I do every Friday? with my nine-year-old. Is, is she going to be latchkey? Or is she going to be, uh, you know, uh, come to work with me? I mean, this is a hor horrific conundrum that people have been put in. And, and, and it gets to your point, which is a really important point, which is we're not simply um, the party that's the anti-Trump party. We are the party that's fighting for that basic bargain, which says that when you work hard and play by the rules, the sky's the limit. It's that basic bargain that says zip code should never determine destiny in this life. It's that basic bargain that says we all succeed only when we all succeed. That's what my parents taught me. They always taught me the ladder ought to be down for others. And they taught me that we're at our best when we are working together, not turning toward each other with a knife in our hand. Hmm. And, and that's why I, that's a big reason why we're winning elections. Healthcare has been the number one issue in, in just about every race. And that's one of the many reasons that uh, Democrats have been winning. That's one of the many reasons why people like Scott Walker in Wisconsin 
are very scared right now because uh, he's been on the wrong side of every important issue. And, and, and this issue of gerrymandering is something I hope we talk about because, um, you know, elected officials shouldn't get to choose who their constituents are. Constituents ought to choose their elected officials. And uh, regrettably, North Carolina has been a ground zero for a long time. I, I, you know, Maryland, Maryland did a partisan gerrymander. There's no doubt in my mind about that. I lived there. Mm -hmm. um, and, and the record evidence was pretty clear that that's why they did it. And they did it because all these Republican states were doing it. Hmm. And, uh, and so they didn't want to unilaterally disarm. I don't begrudge Governor O'Malley a moment for what he did. Hmm. But we ought to, I hope the Supreme Court uh, in, in uh, this term, in the Wisconsin case, I hope they do away with it because I think it's destructive uh, to our democracy. And, and I think I'm totally willing to compete on, fair, uh, on a fair playing field. And, and there's no way, if you had a fair playing field, you wouldn't have a 10 to 3 delegation in North Carolina like you have. Uh, there's no way uh, at all if you had a fair playing field. But you don't have a fair playing field. That's wrong. So can we stay on this topic for just a little bit? Sure. I'd love to know your suggestions for reform. So do you have a sense of, of how to move forward on gerrymandering? Sure. I mean, uh, you know, the, the Supreme Court heard oral argument in the Wisconsin case. And I heard some of the um, justices who seemed skeptical. Uh, they were opining that, oh, it's too hard to come up with a test. With all due respect, they do that all the time. They do that in every context. Their, their job is to take hard cases. And I, I believe that gerrymandering, partisan or racial, and uh, dark money are two of the most destructive forces in our democracy right now. And unless they take it on, we're not gonna fix this. We're not gonna fix our democracy because here, I'll give you a very concrete example. Um, Comprehensive immigration reform. There was a bipartisan bill when I was in the administration in 2013. Passed the Senate with a comfortable margin. I think it had 66 votes, something like that. And it got to the House. This was when Boehner was still the Speaker of the House. And there was a very fragile uh, coalition emerging. Uh, they were able to bring along some of the far right, just enough where they had a fragile majority, and they were, as I understand it, they were going to bring it up for a vote uh, after Labor Day of 2014. And the following thing happened. A guy named Eric Cantor in Virginia, the uh, House Majority Leader at the time, lost his primary. He was so confident of his victory, he wasn't even in his district on the night of his primary election. His pollster, uh, who's probably an ex-pollster, had him up by like 20 points in the last poll. I think he lost by 15 points or something like that. And in the aftermath of that, um, the Republicans got uh, totally um, uh, scared, and it never came up for a vote. And here's why this story is relevant. For those Tea Party Republicans who refused to vote on this, they were acting rationally. If you defined rationality as, I want to get reelected. Because the only thing in today's gerrymandered world that they have to worry about is a challenge to their right. They don't have to worry about a challenge to their left because they drew unfair districts. And the same applies for some of the, the PAC districts on the left. And as a result, that is part of the formula for gridlock that we have, which is why I think the Supreme Court and Justice Breyer in the oral argument outlined a, a number of very, I think, common sense standards that can be put in place that will result in a fair playing field in Maryland mm -hmm. where Democrats control and a fair playing field in Wisconsin or North Carolina or Ohio, or Michigan, mm -hmm. where Republicans control. Mm. So thinking about the number of factors that shape this unequal playing field and unequal access to uh, politics in the political landscape, one of my colleagues here, Professor Nick Carnes, does really great work on political representation. And he's shown that there's this really disturbing 
inequality in terms of who even makes it into Congress or other elected offices. And so I wonder if you could talk a little bit about the Democratic Party's take on equal representation. Are there things that you guys have on your agenda to help average Americans to see public service as a reasonable and possible endeavor? Yeah, I mean, there's so many dimensions to that very important question. Uh, I mean, the, the Senate and the House still don't look like America, especially the US Senate. Uh, it is uh, the world's greatest deliberative body. And I, I believe the world's greatest deliberative body ought to reflect the body that it's deliberating about. Uh, but uh, that has proven challenging. Uh, and the same is true in, um, you look at the ranks of governors. Mm -hmm. And what we have to do a better job of as Democrats is building a pipeline of qualified candidates. And I'm not simply talking about qualified candidates of color. I'm talking about, uh, I've, I've had a lot of conversations with my um, friends, um, some of whom are people of color, some who aren't, in the union movement. And uh, if you haven't observed what's happening across America, uh, the union movement's been taking it on the chin uh, over the course of a long time. There's been a concerted effort at the Supreme Court, at state court levels, and at state house levels mm -hmm. to undermine the right to organize. And I've said many times to my friends in the union movement, we need more folks in the union movement mm -hmm. running because you got to stop being the, the lobbyist knocking on the door. you got to be... You know, if any of y'all have seen Hamilton, you got to be in the room where it happens. And uh, that is um, so indispensable. And that's, that's also one of the things we're trying to do at the DNC is to democratize the process of running for office. It's very daunting hmm. to consider running for office. I was earlier today with one of my favorite people from North Carolina. Uh, her name's Anita Earls. We worked together at the Clinton Civil Rights Division of the Justice Department. Anita is the real deal. She's running for Supreme Court. She's never run for office before in her life. She's one of the most brilliant lawyers I've ever had the privilege of working for. You are incredibly uh, blessed, I would respectfully observe, uh, to have her on the ballot. And we were just chatting about things we can do to make life easier for her. And, and she's, a, she's a voting rights expert. She's a civil rights expert. She's not a how to run an election expert. And we shouldn't make it so hard for folks to run. So one of the um, tools that we've created on our tech team is, uh, and it's designed for down ballot candidates. It's called IWillRun.com. Uh, and it's a series of tools that, um, that we've developed for, for candidates. And, and among them, we've, we've gone into the, the ecosystem, the technology ecosystem, We've, we've kicked the tires on certain um, tools that we know have a demonstrated track record of working. And so we've highlighted those tools. We've negotiated um, uh, premium pricing. So if you want to use them, um, you can get it uh, for a much cheaper uh, fee. And you know, we're not taking anything off this. Our, our goal is to democratize this. Uh, you know, well, the most important thing you need, or one of the most important things you need if you're going to run for office, is cell phone numbers of the people you're trying to contact. Because uh, I don't know about you, but we got rid of our landline quite a while ago. And uh, you've got to take the voter where they consume their news mm -hmm. and where they consume their information. Mm -hmm. And so, one of the things we did in Atlanta, just to give you an example of how we're trying to make it easier for people to run, the, the mayor of Atlanta, uh, a woman, a wonderful woman, Keisha Lance Bottoms, uh, we learned from them about eight days, nine days out of the election that uh, she was four or five points down in the polls. And so we bought up 55,000, roughly, cell phone numbers of voters in Atlanta. We ran a very aggressive uh, text messaging campaign. And uh, I was in our war room when we were running it, and it was, it was kind of uh, interesting because uh, while I was in there, somebody texted back to one of our team members and said, are you a real person? <laughs> and uh, they picked up the phone, our, our team member, and called him up and said, hey, you just texted me back. I just want you to know I'm a real person, and I'm here to help. <laughs> well, that person came out and voted. And uh, she won by about 700 votes. It was razor thin. And she spoke at a DNC event recently, and she said she's convinced that what we did in that, um, those closing days made a huge difference. And that's what we're about. We're, we're trying to build a service culture into everything we do, using our tech tools, 
uh, to help people win elections. We use technology to help Doug Jones win elections. We, we, we don't spend a dime on television. Everything, I, I think television is yesterday's paradigm. Who watches commercials anymore? Unless maybe you're watching a sporting event. Um, and even then, that's when you go and get something to eat. And, uh, and so that's what we're trying to do. And I think a big reason for our success is that we've been able to help people who want to run. We deployed in Virginia in the House of Delegates races. Our, our videographer, we outsourced him to those House of Delegates candidates. There were a spectacular uh, array of candidates. And some of them didn't have all the money they needed. And so our videographer would spend three days with a candidate, getting to know him or her. And, uh, and then he cut a 90-second ad that they could put on Facebook. They could trim it down to 10 seconds for Instagram or some of the other medium that you know, you're, the next generation uses. That's, that's what it's all about. That sort of blocking and tackling, that kind of creative partnership. We, we built an app for um, a local chapter of one of the new organizations. They, they had all these volunteers, but they didn't have a chief technology officer. So we built an app called Knock 10, K-N-O-C-K 10. If you go to the app store, you can get on it. And it's very simple. It'll tell you where you are. So wherever you're standing, you hit the button. It'll give you 10 names of registered Democrats and their addresses within walking distance of where you're standing. So you go there, and it'll give you a, a script prepared by the, the, the state or local party. So it's not a, it, it, it's not a vanilla script. It's, it's tailored. And you enter that information in. At the end of those 10, you hit a button. It goes into the voter file. Because when you're knocking on doors and gathering information, you want to make sure somebody learns about that information so that I know that if uh, you know, the professor is interested in issues one, two, and three, the next time you're contacted, that's what we're going to talk about. Hmm. And by the way, if you're having fun, just hit the button again, you'll get 10 more doors to knock on. Those are examples of things that the new DNC is doing. And, and part of our goal is to democratize the process of running for office. And one of the things that inspires me, and I end with this, is the quality of people who are running. You know, people have asked, why do you keep winning these elections in places where you have no business, in theory, winning elections? And, and it, it starts with candidate quality. It continues with organizing. It continues with having the tools to communicate and uh, building those relationships. It's uh, the, 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 I'm just so awed by people who are stepping up right now. And it inspires me to make sure that we can support them. Hmm. So I, I love this in, in making it easy, easier to run for office. What it's never easy to run never for easy. office. Let me stipulate to that. But we want to we make sure you know there's a posse of people there uh, prepared to help. Uh, that's one of the reasons I was here today with Anita. I want to make sure she knows that uh, uh, she's, gonna, she's got some tools at her disposal uh, that are going to help her win. What about tools at the disposal of voters? So, you know, President Trump tweeted uh, just a few days ago that there's been rampant voter fraud. Um, and he says um, millions and millions of people engage in voter fraud. Um, and so PolitiFact, um, which was founded by one of our colleagues here, Bill Adair, pointed out that that is not true. And, and President Trump has made similar statements before. But this is one of the, uh, the issues that comes up oftentimes when we're talking about voter access. Uh, what is the DNC yeah. prioritizing to ensure that people have the right to vote? I mean, the only fraud is that statement. I mean, it, it, it is so, I mean, this is the same person who said Barack Obama was born in Kenya. And, uh, you know, I mean, when you look at the anatomy of the movement to totalitarianism in this world across the globe, step number one is you cut the media off at the knees. Step number two is uh, the truth. Uh, takes a hit. Step number three is you go after the institutions of civil society. If you go to Hungary right now, there are billboards attacking George Soros, who has been, uh, by the way, if you go to Malaysia, you'll see the same thing, uh, because he has been the principal funder of um, the majority of non-governmental organizations in that area. And then you attack the institutions within your government who are supposed to be independent. And, and when I see these attacks on uh, our news organizations, do I have issues at times with news organizations? Of course. 
Are they the fourth branch? Absolutely. And it does nobody in this country a service uh, when that happens. I, I mean, it is just indisputable. I, I, I will give you one data point. We, we did the Texas voter ID case, um, which was a horrific law whose, whose goal was very simple, to make it harder for black and brown people to vote in the state of Texas. And here was the evidence elicited. Their, their purported reason for doing it was to combat voter fraud. And here was the record evidence, which was stipulated to. There was no dispute about uh, this evidence. And I may have it off by a little bit. Over the course of a 10-year period for which we have received records of voting, there was something like, and again, I might have the number wrong, and I will, be, I will stand corrected afterward. It was something like 40 four million votes cast. There were zero reported incidents of um, uh, non-citizen voting. And I think there were two incidents of in-person voter fraud. That's the Texas case. That's the problem they're seeking to solve. I mean, what Clay, you know, um, you know, General Powell, it, 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 how can a problem be so pervasive and yet so non-existent? Uh, is what he said, words to that effect. And so I bring that up because that's the reality here. And, and what we have done at the DNC is to build, we are in the process of building a 50-state voter protection and empowerment infrastructure. And both those words are important. The protection is the defense side. And you know here, I mean, the voter purges that have taken place in uh, the state of North Carolina are unconscionable. Uh, there are a number of other ways to make voting hard, uh, un un illegally hard. Um, and, and the empowerment side is to make sure that when we have opportunities to play offense, that we're doing it. And I'll give you a very concrete example. One of the cases, one of the races that we invested in at the DNC in 2017 was a race in the 45th Senate District of Washington State woman named Manka Dingra was running. Spectacular candidate, never run before. Um, brilliant uh, person, and she won. And the reason we invested in it, among other things, is because that enabled the state Senate to flip from Republican to Democrat. We already controlled the House, and we have a wonderful governor, a guy named Jay Inslee, uh, who's the governor. And here is what happened as a result of that election in 2017. In this past legislative session, the um, state of Washington has enacted universal uh, automatic voter registration when you turn 18, mm -hmm. expanded um, early voting, all these things that should have been in place years ago that were not enacted because they had that one vote margin that enabled them to stall everything. Elections have consequences. I took this job because I feel strongly that when we do this right, and when we build that infrastructure, and when we talk about the issues that matter most to people, we elect Democrats whose values reflect the majority of the American people. Mm -hmm. And we saw it in Washington State. Now we can play offense in mm -hmm. Washington State. Mm -hmm. So one topic that keeps coming up is the need for new blood in the Democratic Party. So there are a number of people who are saying that people like Nancy Pelosi and Chuck Schumer, it's time for them to step aside. And there are others, on the other hand, who are saying that we can't forget about institutional know-how and the value of seniority in various institutions. Where does the DNC fall on this? Well, I, I have had the privilege of meeting so many candidates uh, who've been running across this country whether it's the candidates for the House of Delegates in Virginia or candidates here. I mean, you've done a spectacular job here in North Carolina flooding the zone. You're fielding a candidate in every state, state Senate race and every state legislative race. That's how you win. You can't ride a wave if you got no one on the board. And so uh, the, you know, I'm often asked the question, you know, who are the leaders of the Democratic Party? Well, the leaders are the women who came out and marched on January 21st and have not stopped marching and have kept running for office. The leaders are those remarkable young people in Florida, in, in Parkland, who, who have uh, just uh, taken the bull by the horns and are making that cause 
uh, a national cause. The, the leaders are mayors and others who are understanding that uh, there's so much we can do. And then we have leaders in Washington. We would not have an Affordable Care Act without Nancy Pelosi, period. Hard stop. No footnotes. That's a reality. Um, her legislative acumen is uh, spectacular, and she has done so much. And when they tried to put Nancy Pelosi on the ballot in Pennsylvania earlier uh, you know, a month ago in Connor Lamb's race, that fell flat because, you know what, the voters wanted to know what's your stance on health care? What's your stance on pension security? What's your stance on collective bargaining? They had the wrong answers, so they had to deflect. You know, and, and, and so I understand the interest in turning the page, and we, we've seen tremendous talent emerging at state and federal uh, levels, and, and I'm inspired by that. Mm -hmm. um, at the same time, you know, age is an imperfect proxy. Uh, you know, I have, uh, the older I get, the more I feel that way. <laughs> uh, for, uh, you know, what, whether someone ought to move on. And, uh, and so I, I am, I'm thrilled that we have both uh, seasoned uh, veterans who are, I mean, you, you look at what they've been able to do in the House and the Senate, even though we don't have the majorities, they've been able to fight back on some things, not everything. Um, and I look at these emerging leaders at a federal and a state and a local level, and I'm inspired and, and I'm optimistic. It's wonderful. So, Tom, we'd like to open it up to the floor for questions in just a moment. Um, as you're making your way to the microphones, we have one down here on the bottom floor. There's one on the, uh, in the first floor lobby. And then there's also a floating microphone. But as you're making your way to the mics, I'm going to ask a final question. So I'm curious. Um, a few weeks ago, a uh, former senator from Maine, Olympia Snow, was here, and she spoke very powerfully about bipartisanship and the need for the Democratic and Republican parties to collaborate more successfully. And so I'm wondering, you know, is that a priority for the Democratic Party right now? And uh, to your mind, are there any Republicans who give you hope for bipartisanship? Well, I'd love to work in a bipartisan fashion in the sense that I, I worked for a, year, a number of years for um, uh, Senator Ted Kennedy. Mm -hmm. And people think of Ted Kennedy as this liberal lion, which he was. Uh, at the same time, Ted Kennedy has a museum of accomplishments because he understood uh, how to uh, reach across the aisle. And uh, I, I mean, his, one of his closest friends was Orrin Hatch. Mm -hmm. So they worked together on children's health, on hate crimes. Uh, Senator Strom Thurmond, they worked together on sentencing reform. And, and the list is long. The challenge that we have today, I'd love to work together on, a, on bipartisan uh, immigration reform, and we did it in the U.S. Senate. Mm. The, the challenge we have today is that the party of Lincoln is dead. Mm. Um, it's been, and the rule of law has kind of become the rule of Trump. Mm. Um, you know, and, and we were in Memphis last week, and uh, you know, one of the things, I, I've read the letter from the Birmingham jail probably conservatively, you know, 50 to 75 times, because I think it's one of the most remarkable pieces of work ever written. And, and Dr. King talks about how we will not only uh, repent for the horrific acts of bad people, but for the appalling silence of good people. And when you have somebody say, there are millions of people voted fraudulently, when you have someone say he was born in Kenya, when you have someone doing things, and you see the appalling silence of so many people. To ignore evil, Dr. King said, is to be an accomplice to evil. Mm -hmm. And I would love to return to the bipartisanship that I had the privilege of being a part of with Senator Kennedy. Uh, the challenge right now is in the world of dark money and uh, partisan and racial gerrymandering, mm -hmm. it has made it very, very hard. 90% of the American people support a DREAM Act. Mm -hmm. But the, the Tea Party is holding it hostage. This administration is holding it hostage. And I could give you all too many other examples. Mm -hmm. And so um, it is unfortunate. And I think the way to get back to bipartisanship is to elect more Democrats and, and to have this Supreme Court decision, which forces us to draw lines that are going to be fair. Thank you so much. Thank all you. Right.
right, first question. First of all, Tom, thank you so much for uh, coming out today and speaking with us and enlightening us on your policies or your concerns. Um, I have a huge concern. My daughter and I were very active in uh, both of the Obama elections. And um, during that time period, she's 20, during that time period, so you can see she started when she was very, very young, um, I noticed that a lot of our counterparts in the Republican Party, they were teaching their children a lot about um, policies and issues and concerns of the Republican Party, whereas we were really pushing a candidate versus pushing the issues. Um, eight years later, and I'm substitute teaching in different schools because I'm looking to start a program for um, kids with autism as well as athletes. Um, I'm noticing as I speak to students, as I speak to teachers, that there's a lot of emphasis on um, the Republicans are way over here, the Democrats are way over here, and I just really don't have time to understand. So if we're not starting to put that excitement in those middle schoolers, high schoolers, et cetera, about what the issues are versus Republican versus Democrat, I can't foresee our party getting a lot better, or, or I can't foresee our party obtaining that gap um, of voters, which we really could mm -hmm. capitalize on. Sure. So, uh, no, so are there, is there any effort or any concern sure. or any interest in bringing more politics, in a light way, issues into school? Sure. Um, one more thing, I'm on a, um, a business alliance, and we polled the kids as to future careers. None of them have any interest in politicians coming. <laughs> Medicine, technology, nothing yeah. of politics. Well, I, uh, as your second point, I, I mean, my... my um, Message: I, I, I would be stunned if people weren't feeling similar in this room. Students saying to yourself, why would I want to do that? Um, and here's my answer to that one. Uh, it's more important than ever for you to do that. Uh, the millennial generation, uh, in my observation as the parent of three, so I have a focus group of sorts, um, <laughs> may be less attached to institutions than I, like the party or the church, um, and again, in the aggregate, with notable exceptions. But you are the most altruistic generation in American history. It does not have to be like this, folks. I mean, we just marked Dr. King's anniversary. He thought boldly. He was, he was swinging for the fences. That's why it was, it was so exhilarating to be there. He passed the Voting Rights, he passed the Civil Rights Act of 1964, which was a 16-year journey. And he didn't sit down and take a victory lap, he went right back to LBJ and said, we need a Voting Rights Act. And, and that's the spirit I see in millennials, um, the most altruistic generation around. And we have been doing very well in the last year with millennials and elections because I think we have understood that we have to make sure we're engaging meaningfully, and this gets to your first question, uh, that next generation. And by the way, they are the largest voting bloc as of now. And so it's not only a moral imperative, it's electoral imperative for us. And, and that is why, uh, w among other investments, we, we, I mentioned that we invested, uh, we've raised our monthly investment in state parties by a third because we want to be uh, better partners with our state parties who are working their tails off. Above and beyond that, we're doing uh, these investments that we call innovation grants. And an innovation grant that we gave here in North Carolina is designed, among other things, to do millennial engagement, uh, to make sure we're building meaningful relationships with young people, to make sure that the county party structure and the state party structure and us are uh, not only giving people a seat at the table, but a voice at the table. Diversity is, I, I refer to diversity and inclusion. You know, diversity is being asked to the dance. Inclusion is being asked to dance. Diversity ain't enough. We are all about diversity and inclusion. And, and we've been able to make progress. And, and I look at, I measure progress by what we've been able to do with millennial uh, voting. And uh, we've got more work to do. And I welcome your engagement in it because you've obviously given it a lot of thought. Thanks so much. Um, is there anyone up at the top microphone? Yeah, here we go. Thank you so much, uh, Chairman Perez. Uh, I uh, only have one question for you. So um, as, a, as a young person and someone who's in high school, um, 
I really want to continue uh, political science and trying to help make the world a better place. And recently, we've been seeing uh, great demonstrations like the March for Our Lives and other initiatives that young people have gone through with. But my question is, how has the DNC uh, proposed to continue these initiatives? And how can the DNC not only ensure that millennials and young people vote for Democratic candidates, but that they also go out there and try to, you know, try to do things such as canvassing or voter, registrating, uh, voter registration or other things that might be more beneficial than just voting for a candidate and then just calling it off after that. Right. Thank you. Uh, absolutely. I mean, one of my uh, goals as DNC chair is not only to win elections now, but, but to build a sustainable and sustained long-term infrastructure. And that includes a millennial engagement infrastructure. That's why uh, you know, we now, for um, uh, college Dems, uh, it's college Dems or young Dems. You know, we've created a line item in our budget so that we're investing uh, regularly in them. That's why uh, on the 24th, when we had the march in Washington, we spent, we invited uh, many of the uh, marchers into the DNC. They'd never been there before. And they had a lot of questions. And some of them were really uh, pointed questions. And I love that. Uh, because what we have to do, I'm a big believer that the best way uh, to build that values bridge that I refer to is to show folks what we're doing. Uh, the, you know, my, my parents taught me that you will be judged by your actions, uh, not by your words. And, and that's why we have been you know, fighting on college affordability, uh, fighting to make sure that millennials have a seat at the table on our decision making, fighting on, on the issues of gun violence. You know, I think the Second Amendment and common sense violence uh, reduction measures can coexist. We're, we're the mass shooting capital of the world. We're in a pitch battle with Yemen. Uh, and um, that's a battle I don't think we need to be part of. And the reason there's a conversation about it is because of you. And the, the, the task ahead for the DNC, and I welcome it, is to make sure that we continue these, to build these permanent relationships. We had. College, we had uh, organizers on college campuses in Alabama, uh, not just here and there, but uh, full time. That was a big way that we were able to help uh, Doug Jones win so that people could see uh, what Democrats stood for. Right over here. Um, you spoke today about uh, how the Democratic Party had had ceased to recognize the importance or failed to recognize the importance of the African American community and taken them for granted. And I think that's an important lesson to learn from the last 20 years. Um, a different constituency that used to be solidly democratic and has moved away from them over the past 40 years since 1980 are the working class and, uh, and laborers and the middle class. Um, and when I speak to I'm from rural Orange County and when I speak to my working class friends and I say why do you vote for Republicans? They say, why would I not? The Democratic Party has not fought for me since the 70s. Mm -hmm. And today you spoke briefly about uh, what you described as taking it on the chin for labor unions over the past dec few decades. And one of the solutions you offered was that labor should run for offices, perhaps so that Democrats are no longer fully responsible for t fighting for their issues. And I just, I want to know how we get working class people labor union members to come back to the Democratic Party, which is the party that, if you compare them, has been fighting for their issues for the last 40 years, but not publicly, and perhaps not at the highest levels. Perhaps uh, we've been doing the same thing, paying lip service every four years to their issues without really taking them to heart. So I'm wondering how we get those mm -hmm. voters back. Well, I think the Connor Lamb race is a great example of uh, what we need to do. Uh, the, the voters that carried Connor Lamb in, uh, in, in that race were largely Obama, Obama, Trump voters, or what used to be called Reagan Democrats. And I heard people say, uh, oh, you know, he's a, Connor's a Republican light. Well, here's, here's what he focused on. He focused on the right to organize. He focused on health care. He focused on pension security. There's a bunch of mine workers in that district, and they've been getting screwed. And the person they've been getting screwed by is a guy named Mitch McConnell. Uh, there's been a bipartisan bill pending to deal with the, uh, a serious issue of pension security. And he has singularly 
uh, bottled that up because he doesn't like the head of the United Mine Workers. Uh, and so when we're fighting for those issues, um, we win. And uh, as Labor Secretary, I was proud to um, f you know, enact for the first time uh, modern labor standards for people who work in the construction industry who are breathing silica dust that was killer, quite literally. Uh, we've known the science for 40 years, but it took 40 years for the politics to catch up with the science. And so um, I, I, I have done many focus groups with um, union workers, and I, and I totally agree with you that many of them uh, uh, said to me, you know, I, I don't know what the Democratic Party stands for anymore. I take that to heart. And that is why uh, we have been out there advocating for the teachers in Oklahoma. That's why I was out there, you know, six, uh, I was out there six, seven weeks ago in Oklahoma uh, talking to candidates who had won who were teachers. Uh, that's why we supported um, you know, Connor Lamb, because we knew the importance of the union movement. And what we've got to keep doing is, is putting those values in action and, and talking about the fact that they voted for Donald Trump because they wanted change. It's just not change that's making their lives better. Uh, and and when, we, when we do that and we do it relentlessly, um, that's how we turn it around. And uh, it's not something that'll happen necessarily overnight, but I've seen that I was very heartened by what happened there in Pennsylvania. And I, so I absolutely take your uh, observations to heart. We'll go over here, please. Hi, um, I'm Elizabeth Crudup. Uh, I guess I'm first vice chair of the Progressive Caucus of the North Carolina Democratic Party. I'm also an African-American woman active in a very rural county, Harnett County, North Carolina. Mm -hmm. uh, you have mentioned a lot about um, that the party will not take the African-American vote for granted. I come from a county where our party, the most they've heard about African-Americans is the color purple. I come from a county where we had to educate our chair that Nat Turner did not write, write Amazing Grace. We have been marginalized. I think I have been banned from every single Democratic Party form of expression there is in Harnett County. But, you know, and, and, and yet we persist. We have found that many people do not know what the Democratic Party platform is. We have been responsible, organizing, thank God, for help coming from other counties, reaching out mm -hmm. to counties like Harnett, and reaching out and educating the masses, or educating by door knocking for the past 12 months. We have um, educated our Democratic base about what the North Carolina Democratic Party stands for, and the Democratic Party at large, what our platform is, because that piece of information somehow did not make it to the voters. Um, what are you going to do to stand up? What does the DNC plan to do to stand up to eradicate the institutional racism that exists within the Democratic Party? I can speak specifically for the North Carolina Democratic Party because there seems to be no repercussions for those who exercise their right to be racist to come out of leadership or to um, there's no repercussion. I've been called every name under the sun, but it's not about that. It's about the issues. And that's where we have to stick. Because a lot of people who were interested in being part of the party shy away mm -hmm. because, as you said, they will not give people permission to make them feel less than human. And if that means walking away from the party, they have done it. What will the DNC do to, mm -hmm. as a repercussion? to the institutional racism that does exist within the party? Well, we've been able to win elections uh, across the country because we've been organizing everywhere. We've been listening everywhere. I've, I've done, you know, I, I think it's critically important if you're going to execute a turnaround job at scale uh, to get out there and uh, be a good listener. And we, we've had many uh, conversations that have been uh, difficult conversations. And I think that's what it's all about for uh, uh, moving forward. Uh, I've, I've never been afraid of difficult conversations, whether it's uh, challenges we have within our own ranks or challenges that we have um, structurally. Uh, that's something we, we have to do. One of the investments we made, for instance, in Georgia uh, is, uh, as part of our innovation grants, uh, we invested to, uh, to undertake uh, rural voter engagement of African-American voters in Georgia because uh, we, we want to make sure that as we move forward to help 
uh, people win statewide in Georgia, uh, we want to make sure that our focus isn't exclusively in the metropolitan Atlanta area. And so uh, that was one investment that was a product of some really good listening uh, that was done. And, and if there are other investments that we need to contemplate here in North Carolina to address uh, whatever the barriers are to our succeeding, uh, I am all ears because uh, the stakes are high uh, and we've got to make sure we're organizing and organizing everywhere and, and, and addressing every concern that folks have. So thank you for being here. You want to go up there? Um, I don't see anyone up there. So okay. Oh, there is. There is one. Oh, oh is there? Oh, yeah. sorry. So you're, you will be next, sir. I apologize. That was my bad. Hi, uh, I'm Josie. I'm a first year MPP here at Duke. Uh, and my question is, um, given your background as the Secretary of Labor, um, there's a lot of public assistance programs that are now requiring work uh, requirement and uh, drug testing requirement. Do you think that this is really the best way to move people towards self-sufficiency and alleviate poverty? Uh, and also, is there a way to tap into the, cur the current infrastructure of uh, the workforce development system. Well, I, I, I think those, are, those, those new requirements are designed plainly and simply to reduce the ranks of folks who participate. I mean, you, I'm, I'm very familiar with uh, many of the uh, investments that you refer to. And uh, I mean, there's a conversation right now about Medicaid work requirements. And you know, the reality is that a uh, substantial percentage, I don't have it off the top of my head, of people on Medicaid are already working. Uh, another reality is that many have um, a disability that prevents them from working. Another reality is they have uh, parental responsibilities that uh, are, or, or other barriers uh, preventing them from working. And so this is, uh, you know, I think part of an assault on the safety net. I mean, I, I, I firmly believe that, and I mean no... I, I, I promised myself I wouldn't get hyper-partisan here, but I can't help but observe that Speaker Ryan, is, he's kind of like on Rand on steroids because he sees an opportunity. Why are people so silent in the face of a president who has said and done things that uh, should never be allowed to be said and done without accountability? And part of the reason is they see an opportunity to unravel the 20th century social compact as we know it. Uh, I have a really good idea about how to reduce the ranks of food stamps recipients and Medicaid recipients, and it wouldn't cost the federal government a dime. Raise the minimum wage. That's how you could do it. But you know what? Uh, that's not their goal. Their goal isn't to, I mean, their, their, their goal is to end the safety net as we know it. And I, I think that's so inconsistent with our values. And that's why, uh, that's why I'm in this job. I mean, every, every time someone brings up an issue like that, my answer is that's why I'm in my job, because we need to elect more Democrats, whether it's the citizenship question. Look at the Constitution. Those strict constructionists who say we must look at the plain language of the Constitution. It doesn't say every 10 years we shall uh, take account of the citizens in the United States. That is not what it says. Accuracy is what it has always been about. I started my public service when George Herbert Walker Bush was president. They were concerned about accuracy in the Bush one administration. They were concerned about accuracy uh, when I was there in the Obama administration and somehow accuracy no longer matters and I have a feeling I know why. Thank you, Mr. Perez. My name is Steve Rao. I serve on the city council in the term, town of Morrisville and also just left the mayor pro tem office, so I'm starting my third term. I want to thank you thank so you much for, for being service. here. I know you're making big money. <laughs> no, I'm not. I'm, <laughs> I'm also a technology executive in the tech industry, so I want to sort of a good segue into my question on immigration reform. I actually serve on the New American Economy Board, which is a national group of mayors and business leaders committed to immigration reform. And uh, one of my top constituent requests just over the last couple of months has been the thousands upon thousands upon thousands of green card holders, H-1B skilled immigrants who are either innovating at our universities, creating companies, 
driving innovation in the tech sector, and they're being told that they have to leave. You know, some, I was in a debate last week on the statewide radio, and there was a Republican debating me on the phone, and I threw some numbers at him, and basically he said, you're taking away American jobs, and what they don't realize, in North Carolina, 25% of all software development jobs are from immigrants from India, or most of them, 25%. 22% of computer development jobs. 35% uh, of STEM PhDs, foreign born. The, the, the data goes on and on. And so my question to you is, after, after the debate, the guy called me and said, you know what, Steve, I think you're right. I think we need to have immigration reform. I've never heard it put that way. And this was a guy that said to me, you're taking away my American jobs. You know, with 44% of the Fortune 500 that were founded by immigrants, I will challenge President Trump and Senator Cotton any day of the week and Sunday that this is hurting America's economic strategy. And if we don't get it right, I know I'm preaching to the choir, but Canada, Europe, some of these Indian Americans in Morrisville and Durham and the Triangle, I'm telling you, they're going back. They're going back to India. And so that's what, you know, my question to you is, how do we come up with the economics? I, you know, DACA also is bringing in 484 million. 37,000 dreamers in North Carolina are bringing $484 million of revenue to our state. So I just wanted your observations, the Democratic Party chair, of what we can do. I'm doing my part. I'm actually right now mobilizing a statewide initiative to get every foreign-born immigrant in the technology industry to rally. We had over 2,000 sign up for our rally in Morrisville on Saturday, and it was rained out. So my goal is to get every Indian American, if it's 60,000, and get them to write a petition. And if we have to go up there and watch, march to Washington and knock on Speaker Ryan's door, we will do it. But I just wanted to get that off my yeah. chest. I came all the way from well, Morrisville hey, to tell you that. You know, I, I, but, uh, thank you. I mean, in my church, we would say amen. So uh, <laughs> I'll start by saying amen. Uh, here's the challenge, and I'm just being brutally frank with you. Uh, I mean, we, when, when the Senate bill was passed in 2013, you know, there was a bipartisan economic analysis done of it, and it shows that immigration reform is a, you know, it increases GDP, it lifts wages, it's, 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 uh, it's an absolute winner. Put the moral uh, side of this um, aside. Um, but um, I, I spoke recently with a friend who uh, works in the business community, who's a good friend, um, a uh, Republican. And you know, immigration reform historically has been a bipartisan issue. When I worked for Kennedy in the mid-90s, we had 80 amendments in the Judiciary Committee on the, on the Senate version of immigration reform. And I need one hand, maybe my thumbs, to count the number of party line votes. That's just not what immigration used to be. And I asked my friend in the business community, and they were strongly supportive of everything you've just said. I said, like, what's going on? Like, why aren't you guys spending more time on the Hill with, with Ryan and with others uh, doing something? And, and you know, I'm not going to mention who the person is, but that person said to me, because we've got no juice anymore. It, immigration has been hijacked by the far right. And, and the business community no longer has any sway whatsoever. So the business case is irrelevant. If, and, and this is why I get back to gerrymandering. And um, you know, the electoral reform, our, our democracy is broken because of the scourge of dark money and gerrymandering, partisan, racial, and otherwise. And, and I wish I could tell you that we have a fix. Uh, but un until and unless we do that, I think it's going to be um, challenging. And, and I, I think we have a better chance if we have a democratically controlled Senate in a democratically controlled house. That's why almost every question that I answer right now, I have the same answer. I'm Tommy OneNote, but I happen to believe it. Put Democrats in charge. Well, that's 2020. So we have just about one or two minutes left, and I'd like to invite everyone to go upstairs and join us for a reception to continue the conversation with Chairman Press. This looks like a student. Um, oh, OK. Oh, yes, go ahead. We'll, go, we'll do one of each side, okay? And is there one up there? Can I, I'll, I promise if you ask a quick question, I'll give a quick answer. That way we can do one, two, three, or one, two, three. I'm Ted Fisk. I'm an education writer. I'm not a student here. Uh, I wonder if you could, it's gratifying to hear you talk about what you're doing nationally to re-energize the Democratic Party, but could you talk a little bit about North Carolina? What do you see as the particular issues here 
obviously we've got to get rid of a super majority in the legislature. And then what's your strategy for helping the Democratic Party here in North Carolina sure. deal with I mean, these challenges? Yeah, I mean, just as uh, the national DNC had infrastructure challenges, state parties, including but not limited to North Carolina, had those same challenges. That's why we've increased our investment, our monthly investment in the party by a third. That's why we've been providing a series of technology tools that are critical, that enable the party uh, to be more efficient, and that enable candidates down here to be more efficient. And that's why we're, we're taking advantage of these opportunities to do the, the innovation grant that I mentioned, where a big part of our focus is on uh, millennial engagement. Uh, we have to build a 12-month-a-year infrastructure. We, we can't be the accordion that we became, where you, you know, expand in a presidential, you shrink in between, and you scratch your head and wonder why you're losing elections. And so what I love about what's happening here, and I give all the credit in the world to the people who've stood up to run and, the, and my, my colleagues at state and local parties, um, is you're flooding the zone. You're, you're, and, and that's, you know, the fact that you have candidates in every one of those 170 races uh, that are out there, not to mention I, the candidates for judges and, and, and other critical offices, that's the key. And, and, you know, again, we were able to help last week in Wisconsin in that race. We've been helping in all these other races. People are wondering, like, what's the DNC doing here? And my, my answer to that is we should have been here uh, a lot earlier. So that's what gives me optimism. Ma'am? Hi. Oh, yeah, okay. Thank you so much for coming. Uh, my name is Melissa. I'm a first year Master's of Public Policy student. And I'm sorry if you already touched on this. I missed the first part of your talk because um, I was in class. Um, but I was wondering. Oh, that's a good reason. Yeah, I mean, you know. Um, I was wondering if you could briefly touch on how you're planning on maybe winning back some of the Obama voters who didn't vote for. Hillary um, and voted for Trump in 2016, and also what you're going to do to kind of um, expand access and ensure that minority voters um, are able to come out to the polls in. Well, I think November. the first thing we have to do is, uh, and, and and you didn't, you're not saying this, but I have heard some people say you either focus on one or the other. I think that's a quintessential false choice. Uh, we we can, must, and are uh, focusing on voters everywhere, uh, and. That is the reality. I'm proud of what the work we did for Connor Lamb uh, to help him win. I'm proud of the work we did for Vi Lyles in Charlotte to help her win. Uh, uh, Keisha Lance Bottoms in uh, Atlanta, Doug Jones in Alabama, and a bunch of other folks. And so uh, I think it's critically important, first of all, uh, to show up. You know, when, when we were losing a lot of races because we weren't showing up. That's an ultimate sign of arrogance and disrespect when you're when you're physically not present in places. And, and so that's why our, our partnership with state parties, we call it every zip code counts. And, and be, that's because it does count. And again, we've, uh, our innovation grant program is focused on three areas, millennial engagement, uh, uh, base voter engagement, and rural engagement. And, and again, that reflects the fact that uh, we have to walk and chew gum. And, and that has enabled us to win. And I'll tell you, the final thing that enables us to win in all those jurisdictions is um, you look at the issues that people care most about. Healthcare has been the number one issue. It was the number one issue for Doug Jones in Georgia, in, in Alabama. It was the number one issue uh, in Virginia. It was the number one issue in New Jersey. It's the number one issue for African American voters in Virginia. It was, I mean, it, 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 it cuts across everything, and, and we're on the right side of that issue. Education in Oklahoma is the number one issue. People think that their kids ought to go to school five days a week, uh, and you don't need to cut taxes through the bone for wealthy people and wealthy corporations at the expense of students. And, and again, that's a, that's a universal uh, value, and uh, that's why I think we're able to, uh, we've been able to win all the elections we've won over the, uh, the course of the last year. Last question, no Hi. pressure. Hi, my name is Elliot Davis and I'm a sophomore studying environmental science and policy. I'm also from Montgomery County and went to Wooten High School, so thank you for your work both Wooten, locally, right. state and federally. Um, so my question to you is, given how much messaging has happened back in the 2016 election 
and the main focus on having a clear and concise democratic message. What is that clear and concise democratic message of why people should turn out in 2018 and what will happen differently if you have Democrats controlling the House and the Senate, given that the White House is still under Trump? Well, the Democratic Party has your back on all the issues you care about. We have your back on health care. We have your back on education. We have your back on the right to form a union. We have your back on uh, good public schools. We, we believe that the Secretary of Education ought to believe in public education. Yeah. Yeah. Um, we have your back on dreamers. You know, we have your back on women's reproductive health and gun violence reduction. And, and we believe that um, America's at its best when we're all in it together, when we don't turn at each other, but we, we work together, when we're not stabbing people in the back, but rather we have people's backs. And that's why I love being a Democrat. That's why I'm proud to be a Democrat. And those are the values that we're putting in place uh, in every corner of the country. And that's why we've been winning races, because uh, when you talk to voters, uh, they want to know who's, gonna, who's looking after me, who has my back. And uh, the people are seeing, they don't want idle uh, chatter. They, they want concrete actions. And, and I'm, I feel... Uh, very confident moving forward, but we've got much, much, much more work to do. And that's why our signature initiative at the DNC, and it's in no small measure in honor of Dr. King, is IWillVote.com. You know, we're trying to get those uh, you know, the voters out to vote. Uh, voting cannot be a casual sport in this country. Uh, our democracy demands that uh, we participate. Too many people died for that right to vote, for us to have uh, casual voters uh, across this country. And I welcome a pitch debate on immigration and other things. And then what we should agree on is let's make it easier for eligible people to vote, not harder. I had a person come up to me once when I was the head of the Civil Rights Division because we had brought literally a dozen or more lawsuits on behalf of military voters who were disenfranchised overseas. And they said, why are you working so hard for military voters? They usually vote Republican. And I said to that person, number one, I'm offended by your question. Number two, I don't know how the heck they vote. Number three, I don't care. They're serving our nation. We should be making it easier for them to vote, not harder for them to vote. That's not what this America is about. This America is about making sure that People can exercise the franchise. The world is looking at us right now. History has its eyes on us right now. We have a stress test unlike any we've seen in our nation's history, on our democracy. And the thing that worries me most is the absence of moral leadership. I am a Democrat because we must always understand that the importance of exercising moral leadership when LBJ signed the Voting Rights Act, when he signed the Civil Rights Act of 64, he understood he was going to lose votes in the southern United States. But it was the right thing to do. And it's always the right time to do the right thing. That's why we have to take back our democracy. That's why I'm doing this job. That's why I'm so glad to see young people like you here, because uh, you are indeed the most important, the most numerous constituency. We're all important. You happen to be the most numerous, and I hope you'll stay engaged. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much.